Okay. So, you know, one of the things about um, homeopathy and the way that it unfolded is that it just got built forward a little more, a little more, a little more. And it wasn't like there was any grand design at the beginning that somebody knew of. And so the repertory became necessary and then it got built. And a lot of people had different ideas about how to build that. And some of those ideas were more workable than others. And it actually took about maybe 30 years of different kinds of repertories before we got any kind of standardization. And so that's one of the reasons why we use Kent's repertory now and why Kent's repertory is the foundational organizational basis for most of the later repertories. So we're gonna talk about that today. And if you guys have questions, please feel free to chime in. I'll be watching the chat. And if you'd like, we can actually open up microphones for today. It just means you have to monitor your background noise. You guys wanna do that? Should we have a discussion? Okay, tag your it. If you got chainsaws in the background, then you know, you'll have to do something about that. But otherwise we're ready to go. Okay. So let's just review where we've been in the last few weeks. First thing we talked about was where do our symptoms actually come from? We learn them from doing provings, from giving a medicine to healthy people and seeing what are the symptoms that arise out of that. And then we are able to uh, assemble a whole bunch of symptoms where we say, okay, Nux Vomica tends to get chilly and constipated and crabby and irritable and GI tract distress and central nervous system problems. And we know things about Nux Vomica because we gave it to people and we saw what happened to them. And so the information about Nux Vomica becomes part of our general uh, learning for that remedy. And we can go to a whole bunch of different books. Gibson's Materia Medica was one of my first Materia Medicas that I really loved, or Clark's Dictionary, or any number of other things. And we can go specifically to Nux Vomica and we can read all about its symptoms. Now, that's great if we want to go learn about Nux Vomica, but that's not so great when somebody's sitting in front of us and we're looking at a bunch of their symptoms and we're thinking, I wonder what this is. So this was the dilemma that Hahnemann had. We identify the specific symptoms that a sick person has when they come and they talk to us. This is what Hahnemann was doing as he was developing his theories about homeopathy. And then we take that pattern of symptoms and we say, this is the pattern. This is the thumbprint, if you will, of that person's illness that we're trying to match. And it's fundamentally different than a diagnosis. So we talked about this in one of the earlier sessions that you could have five different people with the flu and all of them would have a diagnosis of influenza. But one person might have a bronchial flu where they've got a horrible cough and somebody else might be very hot and sweaty with terrible aching in their muscles. And somebody else might have a gastric flu where they're just sitting in the bathroom the whole time with something going out of one end or the other. And all of those people would be diagnosed with influenza, but as you can see, their symptoms are completely different. And this is why the pattern, the thumbprint of the case is different than the diagnosis. And so with the repertory, we're always working with the thumbprint. So we wanna see which remedies are part of our thumbprint. But we can't do that by picking up a Materia Medica and reading everything about every remedy in there. 
And this was the dilemma that Hahnemann had, where he could only remember so many symptoms at so much of a level of detail. And so he needed to find a way that all the remedies could be associated with symptoms. And I'm hearing chimes. And we could access that information by symptom. And so the repertory arranges all the same data that is in Materia Medica, but it arranges it in order of symptom. So let's look at what one of those symptoms looks like. This is a rubric, uh, and a rubric is the name that we use in the repertory for a particular symptom. And this says mind benevolence, and the number after that says 22, which means that there's actually 22 remedies that are associated with this symptom. Now, the first thing that we got to talk about is benevolence. Mind is a section of the repertory where everything that has to do with the function of your mind is all lumped together. And within that, one of the entries is benevolence. And we have to ask ourselves, wait a minute. Benevolence is a good thing, right? Why would we have a rubric of benevolence? Any ideas? How could this be a rubric? Could it be when a situation where the person shouldn't be benevolent? Like perhaps they should be angry or they should, you know, have a different response and they're just always benevolent? Absolutely. That's a perfect example, Marjorie, where we've got something where a, a healthy response would be anger or fear or something, but this person is sort of like pathologically benevolent. So this would be somebody who would give away the shirt off their back and then freeze to death. That's a pathological level of benevolence. Now, we could say, oh, but maybe that's very spiritually evolved. Well, maybe, but they still got to live in a body on the earth. So the, each of these things, we have to look at the symptom. And if you saw someone who came to talk to you and you're listening to them and you notice this is a very benevolent, kind-hearted person. and that seems to be one of their strengths or one of their gifts, then would you want to choose this rubric? Would that be part of the symptom pattern? Not if it was presenting appropriately in their life. Right, because the, a symptom is something that's wrong or broken or problematic or limiting, not something that's characteristic that's part of their persona, part of their personality, part of their strength or help, part of their unique presentation in the world. So even if this person is uh, remarkably benevolent, so that might be kind of individualizing for them, if it's not pathological, it's not ever appropriate to choose a rubric like this. So something has to be a symptom before we would want to be looking at it in the repertory. Okay, so we, we see somebody who's pathologically benevolent. Uh, let's think of another way that that might exist. When someone says, I want to do good things for a whole bunch of people, and that's my major motivating force, and because of that, I take all kinds of corrupt and bad steps to do this benevolent thing. Like I go rob a bank like Robin Hood and give the money away to people in benevolence. So that might be another way. And we could probably think up many other ways that benevolence could be pathological. So as we look through these different remedies, behind them is... A, a listing that says, how did that remedy 
get associated with benevolence. And this lets us track back. So this is JAR, the homeopath JAR, J-A-H-R, um, who was working with Herring's uh, guiding symptoms. And he created a, a whole series of Materia Medica entries associated with that. And so each of these things should have something associated with it. Here we can see hydrogen, the remedy hydrogen, which was proven by Jeremy Shear. And so it has Jeremy Shear's name. And any repertory should have notes in there that say, who added that? Now, a lot of the early repertories did not have that. And Kent's repertory, depending on what printing you get, may have some, but for the most part, does not have it in written form in books. So this is the way you can find out what's the pathological benevolence of this remedy versus this remedy versus this remedy. This tells you what the source is so that you can go find it and look it up and read it. All right, so let's look in here. We've got 22 remedies. A-G-A-R is the abbreviation for agaricus. A-M-M is the abbreviation for ammonium muriaticum. A-N-A-C is the abbreviation for anacardium, and so on for all of these different guys. So how did we come up with these? Where'd they come from? Let's take a look at that. So each rubric, each symptom is written in this way, where there's a section name like mind, where we're lumping together everything about the mind. And then there's the symptom like benevolence. And these are generally in alphabetical order, except when there's some reason why they're not, which we'll go into later. And then there's the list of all of the remedies that have been shown to have created that symptom in approving, in a prover, or cured that symptom in clinical practice. And these are arranged in alphabetical order. Okay, questions from anybody about this? All right, so remember we talked last time about Latin and Greek, that Greek was the language of medicine. So lots of the words that we come across in the repertory about disease and pathology have Greek roots. And Latin was the language of science. And so a lot of the words that we come across in the repertory that have to do with anatomy and physiology come from our Latin. And all the, the words about remedy names, they all have Latin names, whether they're coming from chemistry, like aurum metallicum, which is gold, or whether they're coming from biology, like lac caninum, the milk of the dog, which is an animal product, or coming from botany, like anacardium oriental, which is a Latin name for a plant. These Latin names are used for all of the homeopathic remedies, but these names can be pretty long. Pulsatilla nigricans, or uh, what's the, the remedy name for the potato blight? Solanum tuberosum agritans? That's a really long word. So if we go back and look at this, what if, if all of these words are spelled out? That's going to be a problem. So we needed to come up with a way to abbreviate them. So let's just look at how that happened. This is from Yar's Therapeutic Guide. And in the way that he developed his own repertory, this is from his chapter on toothaches, he has these interspersed um, discussions uh, from the chapter on toothache, indications according to time of day, if it's worse in the evening, pulsatilla, mercurius, belladonna, antimonium crudum, nux vomica, which we talked about earlier, rust tox, ignatia, bryonia. Or what about toothache in bed in the evening? That has mercurius and antimonium crudum. Or especially when the person's falling asleep, that's right with arsenicum, or worse at night in general. 
Mercurius, Chamomilla, Pulsatilla, Belladonna, Calcarea, Rustox, Staphysagria, Arsen. Hmm, wait a minute. Wasn't this the abbreviation for Arsenicum? Why are we now seeing it here? Some of these early repertories had a lot of inconsistencies about the way that the abbreviations were made, and they didn't have any list at the beginnings of them of what even the abbreviations were. And so you were kind of left to make things up yourself and sort of try and guess what they meant. Sulfur, silica, bryonia, magnesium, carbonicum, coffea, okay? So you can see that in here, the remedies are written in italic font and the symptoms are written in plain font. And this was Yar's uh, repertory, which eventually all of this material got included into Kent's repertory. So let's look at another one. Do you guys know the book Nash's Leaders in Therapeutic Practice? It's a great therapeutics reference book. Nash used very specific locations, and he introduced this idea of grade which meant for him, how likely is it that I'm gonna need to use this remedy across a lot of people a lot of the time. And so he has from the chest section of his repertory that's included in the back of that book, abscess, axilla, so we've got an abscess in somebody's armpit. And number one, the most likely remedies are mercury, pepper, sulf, and silica. Number two, the second most likely remedies, calcarea, nitric acid, and sulfur. Well, what if the abscess was in the lungs? Then we're looking at heparin, silica, and calcarea. But second choice were kali, carb, and sulfur. What if it was in the breast? Then we're looking at phytolacca, silica, sulfur. And second choice were belladonna, bryonia, lachesis, mercurius, phosphorus. What if an abscess was threatening to appear in old scars? Well, there we've got graphitis and phytolacca. So Nash introduced a new improvement where he, he also, along with the symptom and a detail about it, like where it was, he also added in this order of how likely am I to need this remedy in this circumstance? And this is called grade. And for him, he has grade one, which is higher than grade two. All right, now let's look at another one. Are you guys familiar with Pierce's repertory of cough? This was very, very common in the late 1800s and very early 1900s, that people who knew and understood about a certain complaint would develop a repertory just about that complaint. And these are very rich, very useful, but they're very non-standardized. So imagine being a practitioner who lives in Chicago and you go to the annual homeopathic medical society conference. And while you're there, you pick up a little book that's like this size, that's Pierce's repertory of cough, and you pick up Yar's repertory, and you pick up Nash's leaders, and you pick up something else, and then you open them up, and each one of them has different information presented in a different way, because these people weren't talking to each other. They were just making up the best that they could. So in Pierce's repertory of cough, at the beginning of the book, he says cough on the morning, morning on or after rising, to breakfast, from the time they wake up to the time that they eat. Iolanthus, Arnica, Borax, Carboanimalis, Carboveg, Chelidonium, all of those are in italic font. And then we get to Cena, which is in bold font. Oh my. So this was Pierce's way of representing grade. And then we've got Cena here in both fonts. I'm not sure if that's from the original thing, and maybe this should be China. Forgive me, that might be a typo on my re reproduction. And then Euphrasia in plain type. 
and ferrum and cali bichromicum and natrium sulf and osmium, which doesn't appear to be abbreviated at all, and rumex and senega. Now, just look at all of this and imagine that you might be used to working with Nash's stuff where there's numbers. And you might look at this and think, well, which one of these are number one? Which ones of them are number two? Which ones of them are number three? Hmm. And uh, these repertorizations are going to involve an abbreviation like KLI-C for KLI carb. But here, Pierce is a little more careful with his letters. And he's got K dot BI. All right. So one of the things that happened as Kent was building his repertory is that he gathered all this stuff. And where this guy was representing how likely it is in this way, and this guy was doing it in that way, Kent standardized that. This guy was representing an abbreviation like this, and this guy was representing it like that, and Kent standardized that. So let's look at Barrage. This is one of my favorite books, guys. And I would, you can go find this online and download it. It's kind of a bother to use because the structure's not fabulous and the abbreviations are completely off the hook. But it is so valuable. Barrage was an ophthalmologist and he understood eyes and documented more information about them than pretty much anybody else. And not all of this is in our larger repertories. So Barrage was, he approached the abbreviation thing with the least letters required in a very scientific way, much more than anybody else. Like uh, he decided that all of the acids the word acid basically is represented by an X. So P dash X is phosphoric acid. P by itself is phosphorus. Um, and you can look at this, it, anybody besides me looking at this thinking, but I don't know what this is. What's BR dash S? I have no idea. What's C dash BIS? I have no idea. So you can imagine the average practitioner having to look back and forth a lot and maybe trying to repertorize a case where they were taking one rubric out of Barrage and one rubric out of Pierce and one rubric out of Yar and one rubric out of Nash's leader and putting those all together. Can you imagine practicing like that? Wouldn't that be difficult? So in his structure, he did, Barrage did a beautiful job of saying, I'm going to show this is what aggravates the condition. And then he lists out these things. Daytime, sunrise to sunset. These are all the remedies that have aggravations by daytime. Or objects, false appearance, blah, blah, blah. And he used, he used bold type to call out subsets of rubrics instead of indentations the way that we see in Kent's repertory. So there was a lot of different stuff that was happening with this. Now Kent saw all these different methods and he came up with one standardized list of rubrics, excuse me, of remedy names. And this is what's listed in the front of his repertory and you actually can also find it online, a whole list of all of the remedies. Abel is Abel Moscus. Abes A is Abes Alba. Uh, Abes C is Abes Canadensis. Abes Nigra. Abras Precatorius. You can look through and see, oh, these are all of the abbreviations. And let's just go look at that for just a minute. Do you guys ever look at scribed? Are you familiar with scribed? 
it has a lot of documentation and you can look at it online. Um, but it, you have to subscribe if you want to actually um, find things. It, it's got a ton of material. Anybody can upload anything and there's actually quite a bit of homeopathic stuff that's out here. So it has a list of all of these remedy abbreviations. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do is print out a list of remedy abbreviations and just read them. And what you want to be able to do is look through any rubric and know what those remedy abbreviations are. And you want to be able to go past just the main polycrests. Um, there was, when I was a baby homeopath, I went, I got a scholarship to a conference in Maui. And there was a, a homeopathic conference that Jeff Baker was hosting there in Maui, and Roger Morrison and Nancy Herrick and Judith Reichenberg Ullman, and um, there were a bunch of Steve Sabotnik, and there was a, a bunch of really good homeopaths who were teaching there. And the conference was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they encouraged everybody to get there earlier in the day on Thursday, get checked in, and then there was a gathering at dinner time on Thursday night that happened to be on Halloween. And so they had invited everybody to come dressed as your favorite homeopathic remedy. And so of course you're traveling, you know, you want some kind of costume that's easily packable. So I made a, a cape that was, uh, that looked like a ladybug. And I just wore a black leotard and my, you know, full body black leotard and my little red ladybug cape. And there were so many people that said, oh, ladybug, right, I, oh, what is that? Gosh, I know I've read that. And you could tell the homeopaths who knew their Materia Medica because they would look at me and go, oh, Coccinella septempotata, cool. So you want to be like that. You want to be somebody who knows all these abbreviations so that when you're looking through the repertory, you know what's in each rubric. And it's not something where you can just sit down and memorize the list. It happens by accretion. I'm very good by learning with gentle repetition. So even if you just printed out like one page of this and you stuck it on your bathroom mirror and each day while you're brushing your teeth, you just read those guys over. And then at the end of the week, you get a new page and you put it up there. Find a way that you can actually do this specific um, learning bit by bit in a way that works well for you, okay? All right, guys, so that's it for our session today. Let me go back to our other document. Kent's repertory created standardization of abbreviations, and he also created standardization of arrangement, and that's what we're going to focus on next week. Now, one of the challenges of Kent's repertory is that it was last updated in 1957, and it's a great size and accuracy for learning, but it's certainly not current with newer remedies. So when you're looking in there at the list of remedies, uh, you won't find abbreviations for things that are more modern. So just keep that in mind as you're looking over those. Okay, what questions do you guys have? Anything? Okay, well then we're going to wrap it up for today and I'll see you guys next week. I'll send out an email uh, saying what the uh, link is for the recordings so far. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. Take care and have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.